You guys may be seated. Hey, let's give these guys a hand. Did they do a great job leading us tonight? Amen. Hey, go ahead and grab your copy of God's Word and be joining me in Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2. If you need, if you need your table of contents, that's okay. Go use it. It's a, it's a small one that's going towards the back of the book. Uh, so go ahead. I'm giving you time. That's why I hope go. Titus chapter 2 is where we're going tonight. Uh, men, I just want to say once again, thank you for being here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because, uh, man, we're here to do one thing. And that's get God's word and see what it has for us tonight. But before I dig, because I know so there's so many new faces. I know you're probably looking, who in the world is this southern hick sounding fella on the stage? Uh, some of you going to say, I didn't understand half the stuff he said. I thought he was speaking in tongues while he was preaching sometimes. Uh, I don't. I just talk really fast. Uh, so if you need it, you can go watch it on YouTube playback and put it in slow mode, and you can get everything really good. Uh, but I want to introduce you really quick. My name is Eric Stewart. Uh, I'm a local pastor from a little town called Lula, Georgia, in northeast Georgia, also part of the Men of Valor executive team uh, here as well. But just want to introduce you to my family really quick. Uh, right here is my family. Uh, you see my beautiful bride right here in the middle. Um, this is my bride, Mandy. Next month, we'll be selling, celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary uh, next month. So, praise the Lord for that. We got a date weekend. <laughs> praise the Lord for that as well. Uh, then, of course, over here is my oldest son, Brady. He just turned 21. Uh, next to him is uh, Connor. He's nine. Silas uh, just turned 13. He's actually here with me this weekend. And then you see, we, we thought God was done. We had three boys. We thought God was done, and then God said, no, oh, ain't done yet. And then he surprised us with two little girls on the end, uh, little Abigail. She just turned six, and then our baby girl is the one that's going to make me lose all my hair. Uh, her name is Lydia, and she just turned five. Uh, so there, there's my family. Just wanted to introduce y'all to know that uh, who a little bit who I am. So, uh, so we'll just give them a hand. So. Um, because Mama's at home taking care of everybody, except I brought the wild teenager with me. So she's probably actually doing pretty well tonight. So love you, honey. All right. So, hey, uh, guys, here we are once again at Middle Valley Conference. For many of you, your first time here. Uh, and we're so thankful for you being here. Uh, but what I wanted to ask before I jump into God's Word, are you truly ready to go wherever God wants you to go this weekend? Now, we know the right church answer is, oh, yes, yes, preacher, yes, we're ready to go. But truly, deep down, are you ready to go to where God wants you to go this weekend? This is what I know. Uh, a lot of you use GPS. Anybody use GPS getting here this weekend that you punched in some coordinates in? Aren't you praising God for GPS and we don't have to pull over like we did in the 80s and pull out the map and get it on the back of the trunk, right? Uh, and, th and hear Dad say words that I can't repeat from this stage. But right, uh, but but I'm just kidding, Dad. My dad didn't do that, so he's probably watching, saying, "Son, I didn't do that. You're telling a lie." So making that right. But in the GPS, for you to be able to find where you're going, you must first know where you're at. The GPS must know your location on where you're at. You must punch in where you're wanting to travel from before you can get to where you need to go. You must know where you're at. So tonight, my question to you is where are you where are you and i pray as we walk through this text in titus 2 tonight that you would truly allow the holy spirit to speak into your life and listen men tonight i need you to be honest with yourself you don't have to be honest with god because you can't lie to him but you need to be honest with yourself because there's a lot of men in this room a lot of men joining us online that you've been lying to yourself for a long time. You've been lying to yourself for a long time because it makes you feel better. But tonight the question is, where am I at? So Titus chapter number 2, we're going to begin reading here in just a moment in verse number 11. But let me give you just a little bit of context just in case you've never read, read the book of Titus. I highly encourage you. A great book for men to read through. The whole word of God is great, but man, Titus really just nails it home. But we see in chapter 2 of Titus, Paul writing to Titus, and Titus in this portion of the letter that he wrote, we see Paul talking about sound teaching and him talking about Christian living. In verses 2, two through 10, we see him talking about the older man teaching the younger men. 
He, he talks a lot about self-control. I, I believe there's a lot of men in this room that you struggle with self-control. You're looking at one. It may be in different areas, but it's something the Scripture tells us over and over again, us as men of God, to try to have and try to grow with self-control. He tells Titus this in these verses, to make yourself an example. To make yourself an example. As a Christian man, he's telling this to Titus. So that's a little just upgrade, getting us to verse number 11. So let's pick up verse number 11. And we're going to walk through these next few verses for our time together through the Word of God and see what he has for us. So if you have found your place and you're ready, say speak. Yeah. Want the Word of God to speak to us tonight. If you don't have your copy, we'll try to have it for you, hopefully, behind me on the screen. Word of God, speak. Titus chapter number 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust, and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age, while we are waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. Proclaim these things. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Holy Spirit, As this inspired word of God has went out. Right now, would you begin to dig into the darkness of our hearts? Would you begin to dig into the places of secret things? And open and convict. God, I pray that this would be a room of change tonight. All for your glory. Take these lips of clay. And may they be a mouthpiece from heaven tonight. May I decrease in this room so that you may increase. God, we want to see you move. May this be a room of obedience in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're ready, say yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's jump right in. Verse number 1, we see this in verse number 11, I'm sorry, verse number 1, we see the grace of God. The grace of God, Paul here writing, he says, for the grace of God has appeared. Anybody in the room thankful for the grace of God? Oh, oh come on now. Is anybody thankful for the grace of God? It's only by the grace of God that you're here. It's only by the grace of God. Oh, there's a couple of our speakers and team that wouldn't ever be here because the death had entered their family just today. But by the grace of God that you are here, that I am here. Grace is the unmerited favor of God toward men. Simply, in putting it in terms that I understand, grace is getting something that I do not deserve. Grace is getting something that I do not deserve. I want to give you five things. There's many things, but I just want to give you quickly five things that we see in God's Word about grace. You ready? Here they are. His grace saves. Aren't you glad that His grace saves? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For you are saved by grace through faith. It is not from yourselves, but a gift of God, not from works, so that no one can boast. Romans eleven six. 6, Now if by grace, then it is not by works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. Grace saves. There's many of you men in this room tonight that you could give a testimony of the grace of God and how He radically saved you from a life of sin. How He took you from a sinner and made you a saint because of what Jesus has done. There's some men in this room, there's some men joining us online, you've been living a lie that you cannot truly celebrate the grace of God because you've never experienced the grace of God. But I want to tell you, the good news is, tonight you can. <laughs> That's the God I serve. That's what His grace does. His grace saves. Not only does it save, His grace is sufficient. 
2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast with all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. I'm telling you, my, my life's verse is on the back of your white t-shirt. But boy, this is a pretty close one because, man, what God has taken, just an old country boy, ain't got no seminary, and that'd be some stupid stuff I say off the stage. My wife tells me every Sunday, I can't believe you said that. And then I'll say, I didn't say that. And then she pulls up the live screen and shows me I did. But, but I want to tell you, I'm glad that in my weaknesses, that in my stupidity, that God can take a whole bunch, listen to me, God can take a whole bunch of nothing, and he can turn it into a whole bunch of something for his glory. If you'll just bend the knee at the cross and say, God, it ain't much, but here it is. All I've got to offer is me and my sin, and that's what he says. That's all I've ever wanted. Oh, that's all he wants. He just wants you, sir, is what he wants. His grace is sufficient. Stop listening to the lies of the enemy that's saying that you are not enough. I had a young man just this past weekend in my church lost. He come up to me and says, I'm not worthy. Preacher, I said, well, join the club, my friend, because none of us are worthy. The only reason I can stand and say worthy is because I can say this. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. I want to tell you, his grace is sufficient, but not only is it sufficient, his grace strengthens. I'm glad tonight that his grace strengthens, but by the grace of God, 1 Corinthians 5, 10, I am what I am, and by his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, yet not I, but the grace of God was with me. Not only does it strengthen me, <laughs> it keeps showing up. <laughs> I don't have to live on yesterday's grace. I'm thankful, Brian, that that grace yesterday was sufficient yesterday, but I ain't got to say, I hope I had a little bit left over. Uh-uh. He showed back up today. His grace keeps showing up, and it's enough today. Listen, John 1, 16, indeed, we all have received grace upon grace from his fullness. But then we see right in the text that we read in Titus 2, his grace also instructs me. His grace instructs me. There wasn't a lot of amens on that one, guys. We, we like the grace that saves. We like the grace that is sufficient. We like the grace that strengthens. I'm so thankful that the grace keeps showing up. Amen, preacher. Amen, preacher. And oh, it's the grace that will guide you. It's the grace that will instruct you. Go back to those first four. <laughs> Tell you what, let's park here for a minute. His grace instructs me. It's what we see right in Titus 2. So now let's dig into what we see that he says after that. So let, let me just read the text again because we want to speak to the Word of God. Because listen, I can say a whole bunch of stuff, but I can't change your life. But the one I'm reading from, he can change you tonight. He can change you tonight. So here, here's what he says. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And here it comes, instructing us. But he just didn't stop there. He gave some other words. So the second thing we see is I must deny. I must deny. He instructs us to deny two things in this text. Godliness and worldly lust. Godliness and worldly lust. The word deny in the Greek is or name I, and I know I killed that. Y'all go look it up. You say I'm preaching. I got the microphone, so that's the way we're saying it tonight. Or name I. It means this to disregard his own interest or to prove, oh listen to this, to prove false himself. To prove himself to be false. It's what this word deny means in the original language. So Paul's saying that when you deny, you must prove yourself false. Those lies that you've been telling yourself, the lies that you've allowed the enemy to tell you, the lies that you've been living in all these years, tonight is a night that God is calling you out to deny those and to prove them false because of the grace of God. Tonight he is instructing you that you must deny. For me to ever be able to deny godliness and worldly lust, it must begin with me denying me. Before you'll ever be able to deny, deny the worldly lust and the godlessness in our, our nation and our surroundings, it starts with you denying you. We're real good to get on social media and start denying everything that we see sin in the world and start doing it. But then, hey, how about turning that sucker around and looking at that splinter in your eye? And probably a log. 
It's time that we must deny the flesh. We must have the mindset, men, that I must deny the flesh. I love it. Here it comes. Y'all ready? The same word, deny, that he uses here says, Ernaimo. That sounded better. Ernaimo, that's used in Titus, is the same word used in Luke 9, 23. Y'all probably know this, right? This is what Jesus said. We want to take a little important. If Jesus said it, say yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is what he said. Then he said to them all, A-L-L. All, he said to them all, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It's one thing to say an amen here, but you're saying an amen every day of your life. It's easy to say an amen when a preacher's up here preaching it hot and heavy, but when you wake up in the morning and that thing pops up on your phone that you want to click on and go look at, are you able to deny it there? When they put that food that you're not supposed to be eating, that stuff that you're not supposed to put in your body, you fill in the blank right there. Let's just let you fill in the blank. Let the Holy Spirit fill in that blank. That thing that you're putting in your body that you're not supposed to put in your body, it can be whatever it is that you're supposed to put in there. Are you denying that on a daily basis? We can come to church and say amen all day long, but if you can say, I deny, I deny this morning, but did you deny today? We must deny, listen to this, what I truly desire will determine what I truly deny. What I truly desire will determine what I truly deny. Because actually you can take that word that Jesus used in Luke 9, 23, and he said if, you want to, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny it. You can actually turn that into if you desire that's actually some of the translations say the word desire. If you have a desire to follow after me. If you truly desire to follow Jesus. Now listen to me, man. I want to tell you, it's, it's hard. Okay? Following Jesus is hard. I'm glad salvation is easy. Salvation is simple. He says, come with a childlike faith. It's simple. It's all his work. There's nothing you can do to do it. Nothing you can do about it. It's all about him. But following Jesus is hard. Anybody agree with me that following Jesus is hard? Living in the world that we live in with the lust and the temptations, following him is hard. But I want to tell you, it's worth it. It's worth it to follow Jesus. It's worth it to deny yourself. But tonight I want to ask you, what do you truly desire? We know the real Bible answers, I desire Jesus. But no, deep down in your heart, in your mind, in your thoughts, what do you desire? Because what you truly desire will determine what you follow. So we see I must deny, but then he just don't stop there. Paul turns it and he says, but I almost so must live. We see this in the second half of verse number 12. He says, instructing us to deny godliness and worldly lust, and then he says, to live in a sensible, righteous, to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in this present age. I must live. Galatians 2.20 tells us, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I, my, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith, the Son of God, who loved me and gave me for himself. You say, preacher, it is impossible for me to truly live a life following Jesus. You are correct, sir. It is impossible for you to do it, but it is possible when you allow him to live it through you. And that's a lot of denying self to let him live it through you. 2 Peter 1.3 says this. Listen to this. This is so good. I want to tell you to stop right here. Everybody look at me. They, some of you in this room, that you say, man, I just cannot overcome this. I can't do it. I don't have the strength. You are right. You do not have the strength to do it. Do we remember what the grace of God does? It says he strengthens us. The grace strengthens us. I want to tell you. But listen, this is what God's word tells us, man. He's given you everything you need. He's given you everything you need. The tools are available. It's accessible for every man with the sound of my voice. It's up to us to put in the work. It's up to us to step up. But listen, I want to show you a verse where it's true. 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power. Everybody say power. power. His divine power has given us, here it is, everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and 
goodness. We could just stop right there and have a praise break because he said it's his divine power. He has given you and me. Stop believing the lies that you can't because of your failure. The enemy keeps pointing at your past and you're telling them that's exactly what it is. It's in the past because I've been redeemed. I've been bought. I've been paid for. I'm born again. I'm a new creature. What I once was is no longer what I am, but what I am has been changed because of the great I am. And tonight I'm telling you, he has given you everything you need. But the question is, are you willing to put in the work? Because this is what a lot of us men want. I'm fixing to kick my camera. <clears throat> we'll come right here. We'll have a muscle, good muscle camp. Jesus, I give it all to you tonight. I give it all to you tonight, Lord. I, I give whatever you fill in the blank where I give it all to you. Help me, Jesus. And then this is kind of the way we live our life. All right, Lord. And all of a sudden, it shows back up. Well, Lord, I, I thought you was going to take that from me. And now here, here I'm struggling again. I fell in the same hole again. I, I'm, I'm in the same struggle again. I want to tell you, listen to me, sir. You can lay it down at the cross all you want, and I'm glad that I can cast all my cares upon you. But my Jesus, listen, he didn't say lay it down and sit after me. No, he said lay it down, pick up your cross, and follow me. It's not just when you bow a knee, you don't bow a knee and sit on your butt. You bow a knee and get on your feet. Because he said, follow me. He's given you everything you need. Some of you right in this room tonight, you're waiting on deliverance when it's already been given to you, but you're not willing to go get up and get it. You're not willing to go get up and get it. You're not willing to get in a small group with your church because you're scared they're going to ask uncomfortable questions. And you got some in your past that you're scared. What are they going to think about me if I share that? I can't share this with other men. I want to tell you, we had a man just this week already share some stuff with some brothers. That man, it set him free. It set him free when he was able to share it because it was something that the enemy had had him entangled since he was a little child. But I want to tell you, by the grace of God, when he found true biblical brotherhood and he found some men that went wasn't going to judge him, wasn't going to kick him while he was down, wasn't going to shoot their wounded, but they were going to say, hey, brother, I've been there. Let me help you up, dust you off. Let me put you on my shoulder for a minute until you're able to walk again. I'm telling you, sir, listen to me. You may not believe it. Your church may not be there, but I want to tell you, there's some men in this room, if you'll be willing to connect this weekend, that they'll sit with you, they'll cry with you, they'll laugh with you, they'll hug you, they'll love you, and I'm telling you, if you're willing to be vulnerable, willing to be open, you can be set free from that thing that's got you entangled. But you got to be willing to put in the work. A lot of us like to go to a group and listen to everybody. It's about time some men stop shutting up and start saying something. Let our women do all the talking. I'm just going to stop for a minute. I thank God. I thank God for the women that have stepped up over the years and have had to fill roles because men have been lazy and they have been sitting down on their butt and they haven't been getting in God's word and they let the women, listen, I'm saying it, I'm saying it, I thank God for the women that stepped up and led the church when they wouldn't know men, but it's about blame time for some men to step up and say, here I am, I know my role. Second Peter 1, 5 through 8 says this, for this very reason, make, mm, make every effort. He didn't say, just try a little bit on Sunday, try a little bit in MOV. No, he said, make every effort. Here it comes. Y'all ready for it? Let the word of God strike you right here. Listen to it right here. For, the, for this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. Did you see that? Everybody know what a supplement is, right? Supplement is something that you take to help increase what you got. Uh, God gives you that faith that you got. He gives us all a measure of faith. But I want to tell you, God's word tells us right here that it's up to me to supplement. It's up to me to grow. For me to take a supplement, I got to get up and put it in the blender. Some, some of you got Rob Roy, man, hey, hey, cupcake over here. He just takes that. He just takes, he takes the protein powder and eats it with a spoon. 
If y'all, some of y'all knew who I was talking about, you, you say, you brave. Stand up, Rob. Yeah, that's hey, hey, cupcake, everybody. Yeah, he's a little fella from Arizona. But anyway. <laughs> but we got to listen. We got to dig in. We got to be willing to listen to what it says. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness. Goodness with knowledge. Knowledge with self-control. There's that word again. Self-control with endurance. Endurance with godliness. Godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love. For if you possess, listen, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, increasing measure, don't be comfortable where you're at. Don't be comfortable with what you're doing. He says, if you do these in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's something, oh, I just want to say it. I think I said it last year. Right now, I'm just going to be honest with you. Okay, I don't care if you're okay with it or not. There's some men in this room. You're useless for the kingdom of God right now. You're useless for the kingdom of God. But here's the good news. You don't have to be. <laughs> He's given you everything you need to come out of that stronghold, to come out of that sin, to come out of that anger, to come out whatever it is and say, hey, if you were willing to put in the work, if you were willing to supplement your faith, all of a sudden in increasing measure, you will be useful. God wants you to be useful. God got you here to learn for you to hear that you can be useful in his kingdom. All these young men in the room, all these middle school and high schoolers, you are useful for the kingdom of God. I'm thankful to God that you're here this weekend. He has given you everything you need. Listen, therefore, my dear friends, Philippians 2, 12 and 13, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in the absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I'm thankful that the grace of God works my salvation in, but, <laughs> but I'm telling you, my obedience should be working my faith out. His grace worked it in, but my obedience works it out. He told us to do it with fear and trembling. I got one of the best definitions that I thought of the fear of God because it's something that people get confused. It's not that trembling fear of scared is going to strike me, but it's a reverent fear. But this is the, the definition I got in this one. I've been using since I heard it about a month ago. The fear of God is simply this, is having the fear to do anything without him. The fear of God is having the fear to do anything without him. Oh, man, guys, we must be willing to put the work in. I must deny, but I also must live. And then we see this wrapping up in verses 13. We see this. And he said to do all this while we are waiting. Instructing us to deny godliness and worldly lust to live sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age while we wait. While we wait for the blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus. He says, while we wait on Jesus returning, you know when that is? Now. It's not next week when you go back home. It's not next month when you kind of get some things in order. No, he says it's now. He says, if we're saying we're following Jesus, we need to be putting in the work now. We must be denying. We must be living for Christ now while I am waiting. Ephesians 5, 5, 15 through 17 says this, pay careful attention to how you walk. Not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Men, now is the time. And then in verse 14, he goes on to see this. We see this, men, we must get eager. Let's get eager. He says, while we wait the blessed hope of the period of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, he gave himself for us to redeem us all from all and lawlessness and cleanse us for himself, a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. Eager to do good works. Romans 12, 11 and 12 says this, Do not lack diligence in zeal. Be fervent in the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in afflictions. Be persistent in prayer. This word zeal that he uses over here in Romans, Paul writing to the church of Rome, it means this, a burning desire to please God and to do his will and to advance his glory in the world in every way possible. When's the last time, sir, that you got eager to serve the Lord? There's some of you real eager about what's coming up in a couple weeks. It's called college football. 
thing. That you're real eager that two weeks from now you're making plans to go watch a game. You may be planning to go to a game. And nothing wrong with that. I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with it unless it becomes a little gee god in your life. But I want to tell you, but you're more eager. You're more eager about two weeks from now going to a ball game than you are eager about serving and worshiping your Lord and Savior at your local church this Sunday. You ain't thought nothing about your local church. You ain't prayed for your pastor. You ain't saw how you can serve, but you're just sitting and it just happens you get there. You even let your wife wake you up and get you ready for church like a little kid. It's about time we have some men stand up, take off them panties, and put you on some big boy pants, and let's stand up and be the men of God that he's called you to be. Lead your family, sir. Get eager about it. I, I, I'm so glad. I, this, I ain't even going to say it. I want to say there's some of you in this. this there's some of you in this room. There's some of you in this room that your children have to ask you every week, are we going to church tomorrow? Your children should never ask. Your children should be saying, if there's a Sunday where you don't go to church, that they're saying, why ain't we going to church today, Daddy? Why, why, why didn't we go? But there's so many. I'm just going to say it. You'll get in the boat. You'll go fishing. You'll go do this while Mama takes the kids to church. Everybody says, where's Uncle? Oh, well, he went to this or that. Praise you. Come on, man. You're letting something else. You know what that shows your child? That church is only important when you ain't got something else going on. It's time we stand up and lead, man. It's time we have an eagerness, a zeal for the Lord. My prayer for you, man, this weekend is that God stirs up a fire in you. That it stirs up a fire like Jeremiah had said, I want it to show up. This is, the, this is the ESV. It's the Eric Standard Version. This is what Jeremiah said. I want it to shut up. I wanted to zip my lip. But all of a sudden, there was something down deep inside of me. started burning down deep inside and he said all of a sudden i couldn't hold it in no more and he said i had to go preach the word of god what was that he had a zeal the holy spirit wrapped him up so much some of you hadn't been in the presence of the holy spirit so long you think it's just something that the wind breathes out there i want to tell you he's here now <laughs> we need to get eager we need to have a zeal the band go ahead y'all come on boys I don't know how to tell you. Come on, just come on. Hey, I'll do it the way we do it, Lula. Y'all, y'all get on up here. Right, here they come. All right. <laughs> Lastly, we see in verse number fifteen, he tells us this: proclaim these things. Here's some of this. Here's the verses we like to skip over, boys. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one miss you. When I read through that text, and I felt like this is where God was sending me to the weekend, I got to that verse, and I said, God, what do you want me to say about that verse? And this is what I wrote down in my notes. This is what I feel he, he told me. Over the past 30, 40 minutes, however long it's been, I've tried my best to proclaim this. I've tried to proclaim what God's Word says in just these very few verses. And I've tried to do it in love and truth. Because, listen, I want you to hear me. I didn't say the things I said to bring shame or to condemn you. I hope that the way I said them opened up your heart to say that's me. And in love, I pray that you would give in to the Holy Spirit tonight and that you would ask Him to change you and lay it down. Because listen, Romans 8, 1 tells us there is no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. If you've been washed under the blood, there's no condemnation. There'll be correction. Boy, he got a big old hickory. He'll tear that hide up. But listen, I come to proclaim it. And now my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will encourage and rebuke you. It's not my job to try to Manipulate the room to try to get you to respond to anything. That's the Holy Spirit's job. My job is to proclaim it's His job to rebuke. Now, we are called sometimes we find our brothers in sin. We are called to rebuke and call them out. We are called to judge our brothers in that way. 
But tonight, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will encourage and rebuke you. I hope he encourages you to move whatever God calls you to do. This is going to be my call here in just a moment as we have time to respond, is you to be obedient to the Holy Spirit tonight and do what he tells you to do. All of this that I've talked about tonight, our theme for the weekend was steadfast. All of this will take steadfastness in your life. Because listen, guys, coming down and just having a moment here or having a moment wherever in this room may make you feel a little bit better. But then let me tell you what's going to happen. Sunday and Monday, you're going to go back to the real world. You're not going to be in a room full of other men that love Jesus and are here trying to grow. You're going to be in the world, and it's going to come at you. And can I tell you, if you truly, I'm just going to be honest with you, if you truly lay something down at the cross, at the cross tonight, you lay it down, you truly lay it down, I want to tell you, the enemy sees that, and your target just got a whole lot bigger on your back. And he's coming. He's going to say, <laughs> you say, I'm drawing the line in the sand tonight, Lord. And the devil's going to say, really? Let's just see. And he'll poke, he'll prod, he'll put everything in your life to see if you're really serious about that commitment. And he'll keep on coming back. He'll keep on coming back. He don't give up. He's patient. He's patient. All of this will take steadfastness. God, listen, God doesn't want tonight just a little bit more of you. He don't want just a little bit more than he has if he's got it, but he wants all of you. He's an all-in kind of God. He didn't say, give me a little. He said, give it all. And tonight, there's some of you in this room. I was one at one time. I'm glad I believe I was saved. I was on my way to heaven on December the 8th, 2002. I was in church. Man, I've been in church my whole life. I had a good dose of religion. Raised in it, man. I sung. I, I remember I remember mom and daddy, they used to sing a whole lot of God, Southern gospel songs. I remember I was little, but they would get me a cheer behind the pulpit. And I would stand in the cheer so I could be up in the pulpit so people could see me. And I would think, he hold my hand. In all those years, I've done all those things. But you know what they were? They were just things. Because I've never truly met Jesus. I knew all about him, but I've never truly surrendered my life to him. December the 8th, I surrendered and asked him to save me, and he did. But then a little few years later, I totally surrendered my will to him. Because even though I was surrendering my heart that night on December 8th, I truly believe I was saved and born again. Because he changed me. I was a new creature. But there was one day in July of 2010, in a homeless shelter in Gainesville, Georgia, we were there serving with our youth group. That in the back of the homeless shelter, I was sitting right in the back, our teens were in the kitchen serving. I was just sitting in the back. The preacher was preaching to all the people that was there. And I've been praying and fasting about if God was calling me to surrender my call to preach. And that night, the preacher made this one statement. And I want to talk to you this. This wasn't in my notes. This is all God just lead me to tell y'all this. That preacher used the Charles Spurgeon sermon title. It said this, when the hounds of heaven get on your trail, you might as well surrender. When that preacher said those words right in the back of that, if that homeless shelter was still there, I can take you to the exact place right there in the back of that homeless shelter. I said, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I surrender everything to you. And I tell you guys, it's been hard. But oh, it's been worth it. And one day when I see Jesus face to face, I pray that everything I've tried to work and do for him, that he's able to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. But Robbie Gowdy says this, Jesus cannot tell a lie, and he cannot say well done unless you've done well. So, sir, tonight, he wants all of you. Where are you truly with the grace of God? Listen to me. Have you ever truly repented of your sins and surrendered your life? I'm not talking about getting baptized. I'm not talking coming about having a remote experience. Somebody pray over you. I'm talking about have you truly asked Jesus to save you and radically been changed by the grace of God? Because if not, right now I believe the Spirit's showing you there's truth. And tonight you will have an opportunity to talk to somebody, but mainly to talk to God. Remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 we read earlier. For you are saved by the grace of God through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. Men, where are you?
are you with denying yourself? Where are you with denying yourself, denying godlessness, denying the world? What are you giving in to tonight that you need to lay down at the foot of the cross? That, that thing that you talked about to God earlier, you told him, God, I wish you would take this from me. Can I tell you, tonight can be the first step of laying it down. To say, God, I'm coming and I'm trusting that you tell me that First John 1, 9, if I confess my sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I want to tell you, sir, listen, there's some men that's believing a lie that there's something you've done, there's something that something's been done to you that you cannot overcome, that you cannot get set free from. I want to tell you, that's a lie from the pit of hell. You can be set free to If you're willing to put in the work and just come give it to him. You say, how hard is the work? It's just simply bowing your knee. Just saying, Jesus, here I am. Where are you with living out your faith? What are people seeing? Where are you tonight, sir? Where are you tonight? I want to remind you over in Genesis. Adam and Eve, after the fall, after they had done the one thing that God told them not to do, they ate of the fruit. The Bible says, what does it say? Anybody tell me? That they went in. because here they were, they were hiding. Y'all know the story, but I'm going to tell it anyway because it's so beautiful. It's a beautiful picture of what Jesus has done for us that they were hiding. And here it is. God come in the garden. It says he come when he walked with them in the evening and he said this. Where are you? Where are you? Here's the thing about the story, guys. He knew exactly where Tonight, you're sitting in the same spot as Adam and Eve. He knows exactly where you are. Not only physically, but spiritually, mentally. He knows where you are. And this is what I believe in his spirit. He's calling out to you right now. Where are you? And I thank God that Adam said, you just think about it, guys. This is the creator God. Adam watched him. He, he got to see God take a rib out of his side. He put him to sleep, but he got to wake up and God, he created something out of his rib. He got to see God do all these miraculous things, I'm sure, in the garden with them. And I can just imagine him just walking with God and God just doing something about him like, wow, whoa, amazing. And then all of a sudden he knew he was naked. He knew he had sinned against God. You think about how much Think about how much courage it took for Adam to say, Here I am, God. I'm sure it is mine, Travis. It's on the cross. I'm not going to exist anymore. God's probably going to strike me down. I don't know what he's going to do. They had to experience death. They didn't know what was going to happen, but he knew it wasn't good. Oh, when he stepped out. And then God got a little deeper and asked him some questions. I'll tell you, when you step out and come to Jesus, he's going to want to dig a little deeper than you want to go. You want to keep it surface level? He said, no, no, I got a shovel. And when God digs in to see what's going on, of course, they started playing the blame game. And a lot of you are going to try to do that tonight. You're going to start trying to blame game and why you're not going to come to Jesus tonight. Just as well, I know one thing we're truly willing to get it all out in the open. God's playing a lamb. And he covered their sin. And tonight, sir, Jesus can cover whatever it is that you've been having. Now is the time. It's time for us to get eager for Jesus. To get eager for Jesus. To get eager for Jesus. I want you to take a moment. I want you just to close your eyes, not for any reason, but I just want you to focus on Jesus for a moment. I want you to focus on Jesus for a moment. I didn't talk to my guys about this, but, but 
I feel bold enough to tell do it. I want to ask my breakout session speakers if you're willing, and my speakers, if you're willing just to go to one of the sides of the room. If there's any guys that need to pray with somebody, if you're willing just kind of go over to either side of the room and just be there. If there's any guys that need to talk to somebody about anything tonight, just, just be there available for them. And these guys would love to pray with you. Thank you guys so much. I know that's me calling y'all. I, I didn't mean to talk to y'all about that. But in this room right now, I'm fixing to ask every person in this room, listen to me, man. I don't care if you're 80 years old and you've been doing this church thing forever or if you're a teenage boy and this is the first time you've ever been to anything like this. This next question I'm fixing to ask is the most important question that you will ever answer in your life. Do you truly have a relationship with Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about good works. I'm talking about do you know him in relationship? Not in head knowledge. Not in head knowledge that you know about him. But do you know him? Do you know him personally? Have you ever truly surrendered your life to Christ? If you're in this room and you say, preacher, that's me. I've never done that. I'm going to ask you to do something bold. Because listen, Jesus hung naked on the cross to die for your sins. He made a bold statement on Calvary for you. It's about time for us men to be willing to say, I'm willing to be bold in whatever Jesus wants me to do. But if you're in this room and you say tonight, I want you to hear me. I want y'all to listen to me real close right here. This is not, man, I've been saved and I'm, I'm, I've made some bad choices and, and I need to get saved again. We can talk about that later. But this ain't, this ain't, this is if you've never in your life truly started a genuine relationship with Jesus. And tonight, right here in your pew, in your chair, you would die, but it's hell wide open. I'm just going to say it like this. I'm not preaching hell, but hell's in the Bible. Jesus talked about it. The Bible says if you die in this life without a true, genuine relationship with Jesus, you will spend eternity separated from him in a literal place called hell. That's what the God's word says. I'm not here to scare you, but I am proclaiming truth. But the Bible says whoever believes and confesses the Lord Jesus believes in their heart, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If that's you and you're in this room, I'm fixing to ask you to do something. I'm fixing to ask you to stand straight up in your seat. You go. I know that somebody just took a deep breath in their heart. Stand up. Listen, this is what I want to say. If you won't stand up in a room full of men that love you, I promise you, you're not going to stand up for anything out there. And I'm telling you to get, before we even get started, following Jesus is hard. So if you're going to stand up, you got to be willing to say, I'm ready to go to war. Like I said, this part of this response is for men or young men in this room that you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. If you're a man in this room and you're saved, born again, you know Jesus Christ, I want you to be praying right now. And you pray for God to give these men and young men in this room. I don't even care if you're on the staff of the church and you're in this room, you're playing a good religion game. Tonight's your night, sir. If you're online with us, tonight's your night as well. If you're online with us in just a moment, I want you to type the word Jesus in the comments and one of our staff will reach out to you and talk to you about what it looks like to start a relationship with Jesus. But if you are in this room right now, I'm fixing to count to three. When I say three, I want you to boldly stand straight up. If you've never, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, one, for the wages of sin is death. We all have sinned. Two, but God showed his love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That is you, friend. So here it comes. If you're in this room, I want you to be bold. This is your moment. Stand up right where you're at. Stand up right where Craig got. Stand up. Be bold about it. Stand up. Keep standing. Keep standing right where you're at. Oh, come on. Give God some glory. Keep standing. Keep standing right where you're at. Y'all keep, hey, I'm so proud of you. Look at me, man. I want you to manage with you. I want you to look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. I want to tell y'all, man, I'm so proud of y'all. That took a lot of courage, what you just did. It took a lot of courage. And what I know, there's some other men in this room. There's some other men in this room. You just seen some boldness step up. And you say, boy, I wish I would have stood up. Well, guess what? You get another chance. And 
if you're in this room, you say, I should have stood up right then. God ain't done with you yet. Come on, right here. Right here, bitch, you. One, two, three. You stand up right where you're at. Stand up right where you're at, bless you. Praise God. Listen, man, I want now. I want, I want you to hear me. Just standing up right here. Don't say nothing. Now, if you've already repented your heart and you've turned your life, that is up to you. This is what I want to try to do. I want you to find one of these men on the side, maybe some man that you know, or you can go with your dad or whatever, and go talk to somebody. If you want to go talk with dad, and go talk with them, and they can explain to you what God's Word says about what it looks like to truly give your life to Christ. I know these men. I trust these men. They'd love to take you, and me and y'all can take them back in the back room. Y'all need to go somewhere where it's quiet. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, man, if you would right now, if you know one of those guys, feel free to go walk to them, talk to them. Guys, if you see somebody you know, feel free to go walk to them. Come on. Hey, give them a hand. They were great. They were bold. We give God the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Man, we are so proud of you, man, in this room. Praise God. Like that, if you're online, we'll reach out to you. We we'll praise God that that's you online. Now, to the rest of the men in the room. You just see some boldness from four men in this room. From older men to a teenager. They're just so bold that they didn't care what any of y'all thought. Didn't care. Didn't matter. Can I tell you, in this moment we're fixing to have right now, that should be your mindset. You don't care what anybody in here thinks. Because guess what? One day, you won't stand to give an account in front of me. You won't stand beside your pastor. You, won't, you will stand in front of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and you will give an account. You won't give an account of your sin because it was paid for on Calvary, but you will give an account for how you lived your life after your salvation. And tonight, if you are not putting in the Word, if you're not digging in, you're not trying to grow in Christ, tonight is your night. Maybe it's your not been denied stuff you've been giving in. Hey, tonight, I'm telling you, I'm glad tonight I serve a God that can radically deliver me from anything. But sometimes, like I said, deliverance starts with me bowing the knee, but then it's determined by if I get up and go put in the work. So I'm fixing to pray over it. When I do, when I say amen, we're going to stand. Guys, I know this ain't much of an altar, but you can come and you can make an altar anywhere in this room. You need to come and give something to Jesus. These men are still standing on the side. If you need to come talk to somebody, one of these men will be more than happy to pray with you over something, to pray with you, to help get you an accountability if you need it. We're here to help you, but you got to be willing to get your butt up and put in the work. Oh, yeah. It starts now. So I'm going to pray. When I say amen, we're going to stand. This is what I want to challenge you to do. This is my last challenge. Y'all want y'all willing to accept the challenge? Y'all going to be a bunch of sissies or you're going to accept the challenge? Yeah. I don't believe that. If you're ready, say yeah. yeah. Right now, I want you to commit to God. Right now, in your heart, God, I feel what you're calling me to do. It may be calling me from something. It may be calling me to do something. I know what you're doing. I feel it in my spirit. And God, I'm promising right now, when he says amen to that prayer, I'm going to go somewhere in this room where me and you going to be busy. It may be talking to one of these men. It may just be you coming here talking to God. But this is my this is my request. I challenge you with it. Tell God that, but then you got to be obedient. Because let me tell you what's going to happen in this room. Because this breaks my heart as a pastor every single week. I tell my people, it breaks my heart to know that there's going to be people leave a worship gathering like this. And it's just, they're going to leave further away from Jesus than they were when they come in. Because they were obe disobedient to what God called them. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tells us that God's hand is not too short, his ear is not too that he cannot hear, but it's my iniquity that is separated me from my God. So men, while I'm praying, I want you to pray and ask God, what is it that you're wanting me to lay down? It may be anxiety, it may be fear, it may be addiction, it, it may be, man, it may be something just you think kind of silly, but God knows your spirit. It may be some hurt from deep in your past, it may be some forgiveness that you need to do. I want to tell you, you and God, but it's up to you to step up and put the work in. If you said you would accept the challenge, let's see. I'm not doing this for a response. I can care less if somebody comes. But when I say amen to this prayer, this is one thing I learned, Shane, a long time ago as a preacher. It's been 
past was successful. The only way that what I've done here tonight is successful for me is if I was obedient. My success does not depend on you coming to an altar. My success does not depend on how many people get saved. My success don't depend on what God does in your life. My success is dependent on my obedience. And the same thing is said for you, sir. Your success this weekend in this conference is only determined by one thing, and that's your obedience. And tonight, listen, tonight can be a starting point. God may be setting you up for something for you to hear tomorrow, the breakout, that he's getting your heart ready because he's ready to pour something into you. But before he can pour in, you got to empty some crap out for him to pour some spirit in. So what are you going to do with it? Holy Spirit, I thank you. Thank you for what we've seen. These men have stood up. God, I'm praying that right now as our men are talking to them, that they are truly experiencing Jesus, that they get to a place where they understand the gospel and they surrender their life to Christ. And Father, I pray that they find a good disciple church. I pray that some of them here with their church, that they were discipled in to be men of God that they are called to be. But right now, I pray for the men that's under the sound of my voice that's right here in this room. God, they're talking to you right now. And I pray that when I say amen, we're all going to stand and say we'll be obedient. If it's to go talk to one of our one of our leaders on the side, or if it's just come talk to you, God, I just pray that they would say yes, Lord, to whatever you call them to do. If they're online with us, I want you to just put the word yes in the comments. If they're laying something down, they're saying yes to you tonight. That's what we're doing in this moment. We're going to say yes or no to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you speak, convict, convict, convict. And Father, draw to yourself tonight. And we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. All right, guys, when we say amen, when I do, we're going to stand. This is what I'm going to challenge you to do. If God's calling you to move and go somewhere and pray, go to talk to somebody, when I say amen, don't you wait. You start moving out. If you're sitting in the middle, I promise you, those men will let you through. They'll probably go with you and pray with you. It's up to you. It's your obedience, not nobody else's. Holy Spirit, speak. Father, draw. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen. You be obedient. Stand up together, men, as we sing.